Good morning. And welcome to Auburn Unitarian Universalist Fellowship located on occupied ancestral land of the Muscogee Creek Nation and housed in a building constructed by free formerly enslaved African Americans. My name is Tameskin Samuel and I am your service associate today. We welcome all of you to our service, especially those of you who are searching for a spiritual home. Many of us are here, many of us were once here too, seeking for something larger than ourselves, to which we could belong, a sense of rootedness to hold us as we create meaning together. We do that well here, though not perfectly. In this congregation, we strive not for perfection, but for authenticity and connection. Whether it's your first time with us or your hundredth time, we hope that you will find here questions that stretch you, people to befriend you, and liberal religious values that challenge you to join us in loving, loving boldly, living justly, and welcoming radically. On behalf of members of the fellowship, I extend a special welcome to all visitors who are joining us for the first time. And to those of you who still feel like visitors, if you have not already done so, please fill out a digital visitor card by visiting auuf.org forward slash visitor so that we may welcome you. You may also contact our minister, Reverend Chris Rothbauer at minister at auuf.org with any questions or concerns you may have. Let's move into the service, willing to be authentic with each other, honest within ourselves, and open to connection in all its forms. Our opening words this morning are from Viola Abbott. We are Unitarian Universalists. When we lift up our seven, seven principles, some of us think of them as a form of theology, but they are more important to our collective than that. They do not tell us what we should believe. They tell us how we should be. They tell us how we should act in, a, in the larger world and with each other. We are brought here today by the fact that uni Unitarian Universalism has fallen short of the image that was presented to the world and to many of those who embraced this religion. But we are also brought here today by the truth that Unitarian Universalism has shifted course to move toward a place of wholeness a place that perhaps never existed for us as a denomination. It has been a long and sometimes unforgiving road to today, but we are here today because we are mindful of the past and because we have hope for the future. We want the practice of this faith to be a fulfilling manifestation of its promise. Open your hearts, seek new ways of understanding. Come, let's worship together.
cellist lighting this morning is from the Re Reverend Rebecca Savage. We light our flaming chalice as a beloved people, united in love and thirsting for restorative justice. May it melt away the tethers that uphold whiteness in our midst. I'll do it here. Ignite in us radical love that transforms mm -hmm. our energy into purposeful action. This is a chalice of audacious hope. This chalice shines a light on our shared past, signaling our intention to listen deeply, reflect wisely, and move boldly towards our highest ideals. As is our tradition, we also light a candle in solidarity with those families separated at our southern border. Our opening hymn is hymn number 292 in the gray hymnal, If I Can Stop One Heart From Breaking. <laughs> One of the ways that we proclaim the warmth and caring of our community is by sharing our joys, concerns, and milestones. We invite you to type your joy, concern, or milestone in the Zoom chat box during the music for meditation. Are there any spoken joys and concerns? Uh, in that case, please no. unmute yourself and uh, speak to the microphone. Thank you all, thank you all um, for sharing your joys, concerns, and milestones this morning. Uh, we have one um, concern that was pre-submitted. Carl Bachman is under the weather this morning. Uh, please send him healing thoughts uh, this week. May all the joys, concerns, and milestones of this community, those shared aloud and those held in silence, 
be received into the care and concern of all present. Good morning. I see everybody's enjoying the snow as much as we are here. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to share with you, sit in, how four friends stood up by sitting down. This is by Andrea Davis Pinckney, and it is illustrated by Brian Pinckney, published by Little Brown Books for Young Readers, 2010. We must meet hate with love. These were Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s words that got them started. Four hungry friends eager to eat. Each took a seat at the Woolworth's lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina. David, Joseph, Franklin, and Azelle sat quiet and still with their hearts full of hope. With Dr. King's words, strong and close, they were college students with a plan. It was February 1st, 1960. They didn't need menus. Their order was simple. A donut and coffee with cream on the side. Woolworth's was busy, so the friends waited. Patiently, silently, without a fuss. They were the only black kids at the counter. David, Joseph, Franklin, and Nizelle sat while everyone else got served. At first, they were treated like a hole in a donut, invisible. Others tried to ignore them. The waitress watched and refused them. This was a sign of the times, whites only. This was the law's recipe for segregation. Its instructions were easy to follow. Do not combine white people with black people. Segregation was a bitter mix. Now it was the friends turn to ignore and refuse. They ignored the law and refused to leave until they were served. Those kids had a recipe too, a new brew called integration. It was just a simple, combine black with white to make sweet justice. For them, integration was better than any chef special. Integration was finer than homemade cake. Integration was a recipe that would take time. So David, Joseph, Franklin, and Azelle sat quiet and still with hearts full of hope, with Dr. King's words strong and close, be loving enough to absorb evil. They sat straight and proud and waited and wanted a donut and coffee with cream on the side. After sitting and waiting and wanting, a police officer came but the four friends would not leave. The police officer didn't know what to do. The students were doing nothing wrong. No crime in sitting, no harm in being quiet, no danger in looking hungry. The officer left the lunch counter without doing anything. The Woolworths man turned off the lights and he announced, Woolworths is closed. So the customers left, including the four friends who went home to dinner where they were served first. News had already spread about the sit-in. David, Joseph, Franklin, and Azelle got their names in the paper. The next day, February 2nd, 1960, more students showed up at the lunch counter, sitting still for what was right. No reservations needed at Woolworths. The students seated themselves, they were dressed in their best clothes and they were polite and determined. No guesswork for the waitress. The young people knew the menu by heart. They ordered, no food came. So they sat in silence and waited and wanted a donut and coffee with cream on the side. The waitress reminded them whites only, but those kids wouldn't budge. They didn't move until they were served. They refused. All they wanted was some food, a donut and coffee with cream on the side. To pass the time, the students read their school books. They wrote in their journals. They finished their homework. They didn't need to read the menu. So they studied for tomorrow's test. 
What had started in Greensboro spread faster than a grease fire. There were lunch counter protests in Hampton, Virginia, Nashville, Tennessee, Montgomery, Alabama, Atlanta, Georgia, and many other Southern towns. If lunch counters could go from whites only to all welcome and segregation could turn into integration, if black people and white people could break bread together, everyone would pass the test. Everybody would score a high A plus with that coffee and cream on the side. But many folks were not motivated to make that grade as the sit-ins grew. Angry people gave the students a big dose of hatred, serving up hot and heaping coffee poured down their backs, milkshakes flung in their faces, pepper thrown in their eyes, ketchup, not on the fries, but dumped on their heads. They yelled at the students, we don't serve your kind. Go home, goodbye. The students wanted to lash out, but couldn't. They wanted to strike back, but didn't. Sitting still was so hard. Practicing peace while others showed hatred was tougher than any school test. Now there were news cameras filming the sit-ins and viewers at home watching it all on TV. The students were more determined than ever to show the world the true meaning of peace. So they sat still in silence with their hearts full of hope, with Dr. King's dream true and close. These were the words that kept them going. We must meet violence with nonviolence. The students sat proud and still and waited and wanted a donut and coffee with cream on the side. Soon the sit-ins grew bigger and wider with students joining their black friends to protest the unfair treatment by restaurant owners who could not serve food to black patrons. They also opposed segregate, segregated libraries, buses, parks, and pools. With so many students gathered, people got scared that there would be fighting. They were afraid that all those youngsters grouped together for a cause. Even though the students were committed to peace, the police now took action. They accused the students of loafing. They arrested them. They took them to jail. The students didn't resist. They didn't fight. Instead, they sang freedom songs to keep the peace. They held Dr. King's words dirty and close. Demonstrate calm dignity. Soon folks were so busy arguing about who was right and who was wrong that they stopped going to Woolworths and other segregated places. Some shops were forced to integrate to keep their businesses alive. But the struggle was far from over. In April, an activist named Ella Baker organized a student leadership conference at Shaw University in North Carolina to help the young demonstrators. With Ella, the students formed the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC SNCC. Inspired by Dr. King, they came up with powerful words of their own. These are the words that became the SNCC slogan, we are all leaders. When President John F. Kennedy got a taste of SNCC's integration, he didn't sit in, he stepped in. On July 11th, 1963, the president went on TV. He urged Americans to treat each other fairly. He told Congress to take action against segregation. This became the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And on July 2nd, 1964, President Lyndon B. Johnson made the act a law. It banned segregation in public places. The hard work and courage of those brave students paid off. They had taken a bite out of segregation. Now it was time to savor equality. Now they were ready for a big sip of freedom. Their order was simple. A double dose of peace with nonviolence on top. Hold the hate, leave off the injustice. Now the students have the right recipe for integration. The steps were easy to follow. One, start with love. Two, add conviction. Three, season with hope. Four, extra faith to flavor. Five, mix black people with white people. Six, let unity stand. Seven, fold in change. Eight, sprinkle with dignity. Nine, bake until golden. 10, 
serve immediately. Makes enough for all. After weeks of sitting, when their backsides ached, after months of being still, when their feet fell asleep, after years of praying for laws to change, when they were so hungry for equality, the young people finally got what they ordered. It was worth the wait. It was served to them exactly how they wanted it. Well done. And oh, the integration sure tasted good. Those courageous young people enjoyed every bit. They came back to Woolworths for seconds and thirds and for many helpings after that. When the, when the sentences were all done, the students left a big tip, a donut and coffee with cream on the side. It's not about food, it's about pride. These were the words that filled them up. Please join me in the spirit of contemplation in whatever way feels right with these words from Yvonne Sion. When I was a child, I would stand and gaze at the starry firmament and contemplate infinity. As I stood there, the boundary that is time dissolved. I expanded my spirit to fill the boundary that is space. My being is stilled and all fear, anxiety and anguish disappeared. Forgotten were the chores, the homework, the ordinary around me. Transcending boundaries was fun in those days, but as I reached adulthood, it became more difficult. More and more, the world was with me as I did chores and homework. More and more, my own fears were with me as I encountered others. More and more, I was aware of the boundaries of race, class, age, and sex. I felt myself cringe as the bantering youth in the street came nearer. I felt myself become tearful as I encountered a senior citizen living with pain or the limited choices of a fixed income. I felt myself become angry as I was subjected to the indignities of being rejected by others because I'm black, because I'm a woman, or because of the blind person or the openly gay person I was with. I felt myself become unwilling to acknowledge my oneness with the addicted person who is my friend or the homeless person sleeping on the benches in the park. Today, transcending boundaries is hard work. For one thing, I have created more of them since I was young and I have built them higher and stronger stronger than they were once. For another thing, I'm more self-righteous and much less humble than I was then. Sometimes when I am at my best, I remember that the other I distinguish myself from could be me in another time, another place, another circumstance. Then I remember the words of a colleague who observed that it is my racism, my sexism, my homophobia that I'm called upon to address. So I take a few deep breaths and begin to release the fears that are the boundaries between me and my fellow human. Blessed be. A religious community is like a river formed from the many streams of our lives that meet and merge and flow to the sea. 
As members and friends of this religious community, we share our time and energy, our creativity, imagination and vision, our talents, skills and gifts, and the streams of our individual lives to create a river that is both deep and broad, a river that is made of many streams, sustains life, and refreshes the land through which it flows. But the river of this community also depends on our shared financial support that makes real our shared values and vision. We will now receive an offering for the support of this religious community and its work in the world. You are invited to give generously and joyfully as you are willing and able. To make a donation online via PayPal, please visit auuf.org forward slash donate. Please indicate in the notes whether your donation is for your pledge or the offering. If you are writing a check, please make your check payable to AUUF with a note on the memo line about whether it is for the offering or your pledge and mail it to PO Box 669, Auburn, Alabama 36831. The offering will now be gratefully received. reading from Carolina Quarick Graham. A common issue in anti-racism work is the use of the term culture of white supremacy or white supremacy culture, which many people view as charged, controversial, or even deeply offensive. Sometimes there are even challenges or dismissals from people in positions of power and authority about it. For me, use of the term is a necessity for these reasons, because it's used commonly by many prominent writers and speakers on the subject of race and privilege, and one cannot actively peruse the work without coming across it, because it's very uncomfortable for me to read, write, or say white supremacy culture on so many different levels, not least of which has to do with sensitivities around my own national culture, national and cultural heritage. So it's my way of directly challenging my own right of comfort. Because when this term is used by someone from the dominant group, in this case white, it is a very different experience, generally less antagonizing and a bit more difficult to dismiss than when it comes from someone who's marginalized in this case, someone of color. And it's a way that I exercise my privilege towards laying groundwork for others' voices. And lastly, because I have been asked to use these words, 
by people in oppressed communities, both directly and indirectly, because white supremacy culture most accurately and succinctly describes their harsh experience of systemic discrimination. It's one of the ways in which I express my allyship. I want to tell you about one of the stories in which Unitarian Universalism fell short of our ideals. And that was with a minister by the name of W.H.G. Carter. Now Carter was an African-American man living in Cincinnati, Ohio during the 1930s. Carter was dissatisfied with the religious status quo, and he was looking for something different. Well, he took a job as a mail carrier, and during his, while delivering his route, he came across literature from the American Unitarian Association, tracts of the time, expressing the Unitarian position, and for the first time, he was reading about this as a viable alternative to the religious landscape in which he came up. And he loved it. And he thought that the black community of Cincinnati, Ohio needed a Unitarian church. So Carter got some of the literature from the American Unitarian Association and despite the fact that there were already two almost, if not entirely, white congregations in Cincinnati, he opened his own in a predominantly African-American part of town. It was a struggle. He found himself working odd jobs to support himself while he tried to get this church off the ground, working jobs like janitorial or mail carrier, and he did the work as a labor of love, never saw a penny out of it. His hope was that if he could get this congregation off the ground, the American Unitarian Association would take notice and that they would help him and provide funding for them to grow to the next level as a great experiment of the possibility of Unitarian Universalism. Unfortunately, that didn't come to pass. The ministers of the other two Unitarian churches in Cincinnati were ambivalent, if not outright hostile, towards the work that Carter was doing. The American Unitarian Association did send an executive director to Cincinnati, a man by the name of Lon Ray Call, to examine whether Carter's church should be granted assistance from the AUA. Call came and he saw what Carter was doing, and then he talked to the other two Unitarian ministers in town. The report that Lon Ray Call ended up writing for Boston was that these weren't our kind of people. They were in a poor African-American part of town, and there were already two congregations in Cincinnati. The AUA did not end up extending assistance to Carter's church largely because of Call's report. And eventually, Carter gave up, as many of us would. Decades later, in 2009, this history was uncovered by the then minister of First Unitarian Church in Cincinnati, the Reverend Chevron Dittmar and she and her congregation began a reconciliation effort with Carter's surviving descendants. 
and that's great. But it also raises the question, what exactly happened? A congregation of denomination that prides itself on its social justice work definitely fell short. And W.H.G. Carter wasn't the only example. I could spend the entire sermon telling examples. But what I want to propose this morning is something that's really come up in the anti-racism world in recent time. I want to propose that those who opposed Carter really didn't believe they were being racist. Instead, what I want to propose is that the culture that surrounded them predisposed them to believe that a project like Carter's Unitarian Church was not right. And indeed, I hear stories over and over again about African Americans and other people of color in our movement being told they're just not a good fit here or there or whatever. Now, when we think about culture, we're talking about the beliefs, values, norms, and standards of a group, a community, a town, a state, or a nation. The word culture derives from a French term, which in turn derives from the Latin Coleri, which means to tend the earth and grow, or cultivation and nurture, according to Arthur Asa Berger. It's learned. We pass culture on from one person to another, often without even knowing it. And it's based on symbols, it's integrated, and it's dynamic. Culture has a way of stretching to fit whatever it finds. It encompasses just about everything about us, from our language, our religion, our cuisine, our social habits, and even the, our music and the arts. It's often hierarchically borrowed from the cultures that surround us. For example, as a congregation, I would say that AUUF borrows much of our culture from the cultures of the United States and more specifically from the American South, but also from other Unitarian Universalist congregations and from the congregations of our political groups. Culture determines how we behave in the different facets of our lives. What we hold as our culture will determine how we act in the wider world. And it does change over time, but it takes time to intentionally change. As an example, if I was giving this, sem this sermon in the late 19th century, women would not be wearing pants in this building. <laughs> And I certainly wouldn't be wearing nail polish. <laughs> it was part of the culture that this was the norm. It doesn't have some uh, moral reason for it. It just was what was a part of the culture. I want to take a moment to suggest this morning that sometimes what we need isn't cultural change, but cultural deconstruction. And we need to start by looking at white supremacy in the United States. Now, writer Tima Okun describes white supremacy as the ways in which the ruling class elite or the power elite in the colonies of what was to become the United States use the pseudo-scientific concept of race to create whiteness in a hierarchy of racialized value in order to disconnect and divide white people from black, indigenous, and people of color, to divide black, indigenous, and people of color from each other, 
to disconnect and divide white people from other white people. You might remember that the Irish and the Germans weren't always considered white. And to disconnect and divide each of us from the earth, the sun, the wind, the water, the stars, and the animals that roamed the earth. White supremacy is the way that black, indigenous, and people of color have been subordinated by a supremacist ideology, literally saying that people who aren't black, indigenous, people of color are better, are not as good, that white people are better than. Now, when people, especially in the United States, hear the word white, the term white supremacy, we often think of hate groups like the Ku Klux Klan. Even though academically and in activist circles, white supremacy has meant very different things for a long, long time. In fact, Webb Du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois was one of the first to talk about systems of white supremacy. And you can find black writers all throughout the history of this country talking about white supremacy as a system. Hate groups are certainly a part of white supremacy, right? But focusing exclusively on them keeps us from seeing how it's baked in our system. Getting rid of the Ku Klux Klan tomorrow would not eliminate white supremacy or racism. In fact, I would argue the system needs those hate groups because they provide a good distraction. Because as long as they exist, we can say that those are the people who are the problem. But we need to focus on broader than that. And it's not about shame or guilt. It's not about any individual person's actions, but about recognizing that the ways our system perpetuates inequality need to go. As an example, if you had a crumbling building and you had people inside that needed to be saved, it wouldn't do you much good to berate the architect. We can go back and hold them accountable later, but if we want to save the people inside, we're not going to, we, it's not going to do us any good to go after the architect. Tima Oaken says that white supremacy culture is the widespread ideology baked into the beliefs, values, norms, and standards of our groups, our communities, our towns, our states, and our nations, teaching us both overtly and covertly that whiteness holds value, that whiteness is value. It teaches us that blackness is not just valueless, but dangerous and threatening. It teaches us that indigenous people and communities don't exist, or if they do, they're to be ex exoticized and romanticized or culturally appropriated. Elizabeth Warren learned that lesson well during the 2020 campaign when she claimed Native American ancestry. Because how many people in America right now think they have a Cherokee princess in their family? As one Native American writer once wrote, if every person who has thinks they have a Cherokee princess in their family had a Cherokee princess in their family, then the Cherokee tribe were all princesses. It teaches us to believe people south of the border are illegal. It teaches us that Arabs and Muslims are terrorists. It teaches that people of Chinese and Japanese descent are indistinguishable and threatening as the reason for COVID. It pits other races and groups against each other while always defining the other as the inferior. In other words, in the words of Carrie Points, white supremacy culture reminds us over and over again, sometimes out loud and sometimes in a whisper, 
that white is right and that there is a right kind of white. It trains us to internalize these attitudes. Now, many of the characteristics of white supremacy cultural are not bad in and of themselves. I'm not here to tell us we need to eliminate these things, but that we need to think of different ways of doing things. I'm commonly asked why we don't have more people of color in Unitarian Universalist congregations. And I think this is why. It's throwing open the door and saying you're welcome is great, and it's a great first step. But when I look at the history of what the church has meant to some communities, as a place of finding solidarity and resistance. I wonder if we've considered what our culture speaks. There are indeed African Americans in Unitarian Universalism and other people of color in our faith, and there always will be. But consider that most of the African Americans in our congregations are middle to upper middle class to upper class, highly educated, and usually not Christians. We need multiple truths and multiple ways of doing things. We need to look at things like perfectionism, to look at things like insisting on worshiping the written word and the words of Tima Okun, to insist on one white way, ray, or to demand comfort in the midst of these difficult conversations. Supremacy has suppressed and oppressed for the purpose of creating confusion about what is important while encouraging us to forget what we already know. It's beyond the scope of this sermon today to talk about all the ways white supremacy culture operates in detail. But as we prepare for Martin Luther King Day, I hope that it's something that we can talk about. Because I don't believe substantial change will happen until we're willing to look at the fabrics of our systems. I'm also not putting this out here so that we can start shaming each other. And in fact, Adrian Marie Brown has recently written a book in which she chastises fellow activists for, she chastises fellow activists for casting each other out for not being perfect in doctrine. But we do need to recognize that all of us, regardless of race, are harmed by white supremacy culture. And any deconstruction must recognize that we're shedding light on the water we swim in. We're all in this together. And as Cynthia Brown says, I will say that white supremacy wants us to attack each other as the problem. As we fight among each other, we fail to identify the actual problem. Just as focusing on hate groups as the sole manifestation of white supremacy keeps us from recognizing the many ways in which it manifests. Attacking each other will also do the same thing. We need to recognize these characteristics really aren't working for anyone. And we need to learn to look at other ways of doing things. As Brown continues, our, per our course sometimes our behavior, of course sometimes our behavior is a problem. Our conditioning is a problem. And then we can, when we are able, help each other through. It's gonna take each one of us 
dismantling white supremacy, I, I sometimes hesitate to preach on Martin Luther King because so often Martin Luther King sermons are feel-good sermons that take from the I Have a Dream speech, which is a wonderful speech, but it was aspirational. King went to his grave knowing that aspiration hadn't happened yet, and it still hasn't happened. But I believe that dismantling our systems is how we get there. It's going to be imperfect. We're going to mess up. We always do because we're humans. And I'm okay with that. And I need everyone to be okay with that. Because even in our messiness, we're doing good work. And our messiness is what's going to get us to that aspiration. I believe that during this work, of dismantling white supremacy culture, we will be able to see the value in more and more people, their inherent worth and dignity. We can recognize that different ways of doing things aren't necessarily wrong, just different. And we can start to appreciate the gifts that different people bring to the table and stop expecting everyone to be homogenous. We want to build an inclusive community. Dismantling white supremacy culture will help people to feel valued for who they are and open the doors for a truly inclusive community. It's a complicated task to evaluate people of the past because they were all swimming in very different waters than we were. I would like to think that in many areas of their lives, the people who opposed W.H.G. Carter's ministry were good people who thought who were doing the best they knew how. But we can look at these failures from the past, I believe, and we can use them as a springboard for new ways of being. It's not about erasing our history as some reactionaries would have us believe, but it's about recognizing that until we're able to see how our history continues to affect us, how it continues to be baked into the systems that we are in, that we'll be able to truly move into a new way of being towards a beloved community and towards actually realizing that dream that Dr. King so fervently believed in. May it be so. Our closing hymn is number 1017 in the Teal Hymnal, Building a New Way.
Please join me in extinguishing our chalice. Uh, you will find the words displayed on the screen. We extinguish, we extinguish this flame, but not the, but light, not of the light of truth. The warmth, community, or the fire, or the fire of, of commitment. These carry we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Please uh, stay around for our virtual coffee hour. Uh, if there are um, more people, the breakout rooms will be open. Otherwise, the main room will be open for our uh, for conversations following the service. If you are not signed up for our email list, please make sure to do so to receive updates about ways to connect. You can find information on signing up at our website auuf.org forward slash subscribe. Please, please now uh, join us for our song benediction. Before we, uh, before I say our benediction, I just, I've sent out several things to the listserv already, but I just want to thank everyone who's been a part of keeping the fellowship going while Calvin and I had COVID last week. So thank you to everyone who, who has been a part of that. And thank you for, especially to them for pivoting so gracefully and thanks to everyone who made this morning's service possible. Our benediction is by Kimberly Quinn Johnson. In the words of June Jordan, we are the ones we have been waiting for. We are not perfect, but we are perfectly fitted for this day. We are not without fault, but we can be honest to face our past as we chart a new future. We are the ones we've been waiting for. May we be bold and courageous to chart that new future. May we have faith in a future that is not known. We are the ones we have been waiting for. Amen. Blessed be and go in peace. <laughs>